frequently get asked. I would say every single week I go speak, which is 52 weeks a year now for 16 years. Every single week somebody will say, now Hovind, how do we see stars billions of light years away? You say the earth is only 6,000 years old. How do we see the stars? Yesterday on the radio program on, on the website, Dr. Dino, some guy called in and said, now, Hovind, I did some studies and in a 6,000 year light year radius, we'd only have so many cubic miles and uh, all the stars wouldn't fit. I said, oh, wait, wait, wait. You're, you're, who said anything about a 6,000 mile radius? He said, well, you're the one that said the universe is only 6,000 years old. Yes, I did. But I did not say all the stars are within a 6,000 light year radius. <laughs> I've never said that. That would be ludicrous. But how do we see the stars billions of light years away if the universe is only 6,000 years old? And I believe the Bible clearly teaches it's only 6,000 years old and God made everything. Actually, He made the earth first in Genesis 1 and then verse 14, He made the stars also. Evolution says He made the stars evolve first and then the earth. Well, there's certainly a lot of stars out there. Nehemiah chapter 9 says, Thou, even thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made the heaven, the heaven of heavens. God is claiming that He made them. So, either He did or He didn't. But what about the stars? How do they fit in? Astronomers can see a star blow up about every 30 years. It's not, every, no, it's not like it's on a timetable. It might be every five years, it might be every 50 years, but on an average, every 30 years, a star explodes. And they're looking out there with their telescope and say, oh wow, there's a new one. A star exploded. It's called a nova. Or if it's a big one, they call it a supernova. Uh, <clears throat> nova in Spanish means no go. By the way, the Chevy Nova did not sell very well in Mexico for that reason. Hey, do you want to buy a nova? No. Why would I do that? <laughs> it won't go. But <clears throat> stars blow up every 30 years. Well, they've searched the heavens with these telescopes looking for how many supernova rings are there. They call it a dead star. Or, they can find less than 300. Now, wait a minute. If there are less than 300 supernova rings, and one happens every 30 years, you can do the math. I mean, that's about 9,000 years. If the universe is billions of years old, there ought to be a whole lot more supernova rings out there. Why are there less than 300 supernova rings? Uh, because it's less than 10,000 years old? Boy, they don't like that answer at all. But that's the logical conclusion. Anyway, if stars are blowing up every 30 years, we would have to have at least one star born every 30 years just to keep the balance. I mean, countries that have a population problem because they're getting less births and deaths, you know, like Germany, more people are dying than being born. Oh, well, eventually that's going to create a problem, okay? Uh, stars should have to be born. Nobody's ever seen one star form. Not one. We see them blow up all the time. They've never seen a star form, and I'll cover that in a second. Its last estimate by Hubble Telescope was that there are 70 sextillion stars. 70 sextillion. They say the universe is 20 billion years old. Well, you can do the math. That means six and a half million stars would have to form every minute. We'd have to have six and a half million stars forming every minute for 20 billion years to make the stars that we know about. It doesn't count the ones we don't know about because we can't see them yet. Who knows how many stars are out there? Sometimes the textbooks will say, well, there are new stars being constantly born in clouds of gas and dust. This is so stupid. How a physics textbook can teach this, I don't know. Anybody that knows freshman physics knows when you try to squeeze gases together, it pressure builds up, temperature builds up, and it drives them back apart. It's called Boyle's Gas Law. Nobody has ever seen dust collapsing into a solid. It would take such incredible pressure to do that. I, I was in a debate one time and this professor, I asked him, I said, how can you get dust to collapse into a, into a solid? Explain that to me. He said, well, we calculated that if 20 stars explode near each other, it'll produce enough pressure to make a brand new star. I said, now that's brilliant. You got to lose 20 to gain one. Hmm? I said, you ought to run for Congress. You could help those guys borrow their way out of debt, you know. <laughs> it's not going to get a universe full of stars if you've got to lose 20 to gain one. And even that is only theoretical. It's never been observed, okay. I was in Alamogordo, New Mexico, and they've got a science center down there, and they showed these pictures of star babies. They said, oh, this is a new star forming. No, sir, it's a bright spot, okay. One guy in Science Magazine admitted, the silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. Nobody knows how stars can form from dust clouds. No one has unambiguously observed material falling into an embryonic star, which should be happening if the star is truly still forming. 
and no one has caught a molecular cloud in the act of collapsing. Precisely how a section of interstellar cloud collapses gravitationally into a star, a double or multiple star, or a solar system is still a challenging theoretical problem. Astronomers have yet to find an interstellar cloud in the actual process of collapse. The origin of stars represents one of the most fundamental unsolved problems of contemporary physics. This guy said, no one really understands how star formation proceeds. It's really remarkable. Nobody knows how this happens. So if they tell you new stars are forming, you tell them Kent Hovind said they're confused or they're lying. Because nobody knows how it happens. There's not even a good theory how you can squeeze dust into a star. Not e and there's certainly no evidence. But here's what happens. They see bright spots appear in the clouds. Or not in the clouds, in the star, uh, dust clouds in space. They look at this crab nebula or eagle nebula and they're staring at it and all of a sudden one day a spot gets a little brighter. Oh wow, a star is being born. That's immediately their conclusion that a star is being born. I said, wait, wait, wait. Maybe the dust in front of it is clearing and the star was already there. Hmm? Maybe it's a star blowing up. Maybe it's another supernova. Because that's what happens when stars supernova, they get really bright. They don't know that a star is forming. So don't let them tell you that we've seen stars form. Nobody has seen such a thing. All we do is we see them blow up, which is the opposite of what evolutionists need. Now, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and he made the stars also. Here God is claiming he made the stars, and it says in Psalm, he counts the number of the stars. Not only how many there are total, but each one has its own number. So God will say, oh, this is star number 42 trillion, you know, 718 billion. He, he, he knows the number of each one. And it says, praise him, ye waters that be above the heavens in Psalm 148. This is the only verse that says anything like this. Waters that be above the heavens. Now in Genesis uh, 1, it talks about verse 6 and 7, water that be above the heavens. I believe when God first made the world, it was very, very different than what we see. Mostly land, instead of the huge oceans that we now have. Most of that water was in the crust of the earth. We covered that in video two. But there was earth and there was heaven, singular. King James is the only Bible I'm aware of that gets it right in Genesis 1.1, where it says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. All the rest of them say heavens. Okay, that's a mistake. There was heaven, which means expanded place. There was earth, and then from here, on out. Then he divides it up into three slices. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven. The first heaven is where the birds fly. Genesis 1 uh, talks about that, verse 20 and 21. Then there was water above the firmament. Now some creationists do not believe in the canopy theory. I understand. I've read their stuff. I think they're wrong. I, th I still believe even, and some accuse me, well, you know, you don't agree with us, therefore, you know, you're not a good creation scientist. You know, to keep up on your research. I keep very much up on the research and I disagree. It's not that I haven't read it, it's that I have read it and disagree. <laughs> okay. But I believe there was a layer of air for Adam to breathe, a layer of water above to protect him, and then a layer of stars, and then more water. The only verse I have to back it up is right here, Psalm 148. Praise him, ye waters that be above the heavens. That's present tense. Is there still water above the heavens? Psalm 104 says, he layeth, Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Could it be that there is another layer of water beyond all of outer space? Maybe everything that we see as this universe, which looks like huge, maybe everything we see is inside water, a crystal, and God is outside of that, the third heaven, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Could there be a third layer where God lives? Of course, God doesn't need a place to live. He, he just is, you know. Psalm 20, 29 says, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The Lord is upon many waters. Maybe everything that we see when we step out at night and say, Wow, look at all these stars. Maybe the whole thing is a little snow globe on God's dresser. You know, that he picks up and shakes once in a while. How you doing in there? You know? <laughs> I don't know. I like to think that way. But the Psalm 148, the waters that be above the heavens, you know, people have often asked, Hey, where does, where's the last star? And once we find it, what's on the other side? I don't know the answers to those, but just a possibility is that there, according to the Bible, may still be water above the heavens. But there's a lot of stars out there. Hubble estimate was 11 trillion stars per person. That is 76 trillion divided by 6 billion people. Every one of you gets 70, gets 11 trillion stars. What happened, they told the Hubble telescope to focus in on a dot. <clears throat> they found a dot above the Big Dipper, 
you can see the picture of it there, it is about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. And it was black. They said, we don't think there's any stars there. Let's focus in on that spot and see what we can find. They took pictures for 10 days straight, focusing in on that dot. After 10 days, they, there were more stars in that dot than they could count. These were brand new stars, never been seen before. Called it Deep Field, uh, uh, Hubble Deep Field. Looking up there saying, man, that's stuff we didn't know about. Assumption would be that it's that way all through space. Truly, the stars cannot be numbered, which is what the Bible says, they cannot be numbered. But how do you tell the distance to the stars and how can the earth be 6,000 years old and the stars be so far away? Fair question. Uh, Stephen Hawking said, stars are so far away, they appear to be just pinpoints of light. We cannot see their size or shape. How do we tell different types of stars apart? For the vast majority, there's only one thing we can see and that is the color of their light. If you get the biggest telescope on earth, this is not it by the way, <coughs> spotting scope, but if you get the largest telescope on earth and look at the closest star, which is Alpha Centauri, four and a half light years away, all you're going to see is a dot. If I focus this in on the sun, it'll start to get you know, bigger and bigger and you can actually flames, see flames leaping off and see the spicules and you can see color changes and you can actually see features of the sun. When you look at a star, you never get to see that. Nobody has ever seen a star as far as any of the features of it. You get the biggest telescope on Earth, it's going to be nothing but a dot in your scope. All you can tell is, I said, that's a red one, that's a yellow one, that's a blue one. That's all you can see. So anything we do, we have to make, do based on assumptions just from the color. But how do you tell the distance to the star? Well. I taught high school trig for years, and if you guys had trig, you know how it works. Uh, if you have two observation points, you can calculate the third distance. You have to know it. It's a solving a triangle. Trigonometry deals with triangles, so you sine, cosine, tangent. If you know two, one distance and two angles, or two, two distances and one angle, you can calculate the rest of the triangle using sine, cosine, tangent. Here's the problem. Earth is only 8,000 miles in diameter, which compared to star distance is, is zero, it's nothing. So if I'm looking at a star and somebody over in China is looking at a star, we are 8,000 miles away from each other, straight line through the earth. That would be nothing. What they've done to enlarge the distance to look at a star, instead of just being opposite sides of the earth, the earth is also going around the sun in this great big huge circle. We're going 66,000 miles an hour and it takes us a year to go around. Great big racetrack. Well, the distance from the Earth to the Sun is about 93 million miles, average, and that's, that's a lot, but at the speed of light, it's not much. At the speed of light, it's eight minutes away. It takes the sunlight eight minutes to get to the Earth. So if we're eight, mi eight light minutes from the Sun, the diameter of our orbit going around is 16 light minutes. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a star in January. And then we're going to look at the star in June, and we have now gone halfway around this monster circle. And we're going to get two observation points to try to enlarge the base of our triangle. And it sounds huge. Man, that's 186 million miles. Well, it's still not much. A year has 525,000 minutes in a year. If this picture here showing the little yellow dot was the scale, if that yellow dot represented Earth's orbit, not the Earth's diameter, the orbit of the Earth. It's way too big for the picture. What we're going to do is try to get to show you the math involved here. If I had two surveyors setting up with their transits or telescopes, and they are 16 inches away from each other, and they're both looking at a dot 525,000 inches away, which is eight and a third miles, would you agree that would make a rather skinny triangle? Let's go out in the parking lot and draw a triangle with you know, point A and point B 16 inches apart and point C eight and a third miles away. It's going to make a real skinny triangle. That is exactly the triangle you get when two people on opposite sides of Earth's orbit try to measure one light year. One. Now, and I'm not sure exact, you can tell exactly where you were six months ago. I think that would be a little stretch of the imagination to say, oh yeah, six months ago in January we were, where were we? <laughs> I'll give them that. I won't even argue that. I just would bring that up you know, for appeal, Your Honor, in case we need to. Uh, you can't know exactly where you were six months ago. 
but the angle you get with that is 0 0.017 degrees. Now let's imagine this. I want you to get two guys to set up their surveying transits. They're 16 inches apart, and I'm going to go put a dot eight and a third miles away, but they don't know how far away it is. They're both focusing in on the dot, and they see this dot out there. Here's the only information they have. The measurement between themselves, 16 inches, and the angle out of parallel. I say, guys, I want you to calculate how far away that dot is based on that little angle change you get. I think that would be difficult to measure. One light year. You'd certainly be, there'd be some guesswork involved, okay? Now, if you want to measure 100 light years, you've got a much worse problem. Now you've got to move your dot 830 miles away. If we had two guys on the roof of this building here in Pensacola, Florida, 16 inches apart, and they're both focusing on a dot in Chicago, which is 830 miles away, but they don't know how far away it is, they're going to tell me how far away it is, based only on their angle of their telescope out of parallel. I would say that's impossible. Impossible. To measure 15 billion, no question, that's impossible. I don't think you can measure 100 light years. Not with real numbers, not with real measurements, but this textbook says they can measure, parallax trigonometry can measure up to 100 light years. Okay, I doubt it, but I'll give them 100. I'll give them 1,000 if they quit crying, okay? The fact is you can't measure a billion. Simple fact. So here's some things to consider about starlight. The, it said in, in 2004, that the new SIM technology, Space Interferometry Mission, they hope to get where they can improve the distance of measuring star to stars. And they say this accuracy will enable SIM to determine stellar distances to 10% accuracy out to a distance of 482,000 million million miles. That's 82,000 light years. And then it says, this is an improvement of several hundred times over what is possible today. Well, now, wait a minute. If they're going to improve it several hundred times, and it ends up being 82,000, what's 82,000 divided by several hundred comes out to be several hundred. Apparently, they're admitting they can only measure several hundred light years, which I would agree. I mean, I would say that's even a stretch, but I'll give them several hundred. They can't measure billions, is the point. So when your students in school get taught, oh, that, that star is, you know, 14.629 you know, billion light years away, say, I don't believe you. I don't believe you at all. It might be, but you can't prove that. They're making up a story. With SIM technology, they hope to finally be able to get out to where they can measure most of the way across our galaxy, and we're in it. We can't even measure across our own galaxy, let alone these distances to other galaxies. So I think we should look at the stars and say, wow. What a mighty God we serve. Instead of going out there and saying, well, we know how far that way it is, we know it evolved. I mean, it's just that egotistical attitude some of these atheists get that makes you want to slap them in the face like, man, why don't you serve God? Look what he made, you know? Here's the things to consider concerning starlight. Then we'll take a break. Number one, we cannot measure these great distances. They just cannot be done. Number two, nobody knows what light is. is it, they call it a wave or a photon or a particle. You know, we, we, we know what it does. We use it all the time. But actually, give me a jar of it and paint it red. Nobody knows the substance of it. What is light? And we sure don't know that it always travels the same speed all through time or space. The entire theory behind a black hole is that light can be attracted by gravity. Well, if light can be attracted by gravity, then you cannot say the speed of light is a constant. Okay? At Harvard University back in 99, they slowed light down to 38 miles an hour. The next year, they slowed it down to one mile an hour and the next year brought it to a dead stop. Light goes, you know, pretty quick, 186,000 miles a second. They slowed it down. It was done at Harvard, it was done at Smithsonian, it was done at Cambridge University, a repeatable, demonstrable experiment. Now that is science. If you do an experiment, get a result, somebody else follows your data, does the same experiment, gets the same result, that's science. They slowed light down. This article came out on Fox News Channel. They said, we've succeeded in holding a light pulse still. They brought the speed of light to zero, brought it to a dead stop. Meanwhile, back in 2000 at Princeton University, they speeded light up to 300 times the speed of light. So when somebody says that star is 10 billion light years away, which I doubt they can measure, therefore that we can prove the universe is 10 billion years old, they got several problems in their logic right away that they probably don't see, which is why we do these seminars, so we can help people understand. 
It's 300 times the speed of light. Uh, astronomer Barry Setterfield, uh, Australian government astronomer, said, during the last 300 years, 164 measurements of the speed of light have been published using 16 different measurement techniques. The speed of light has apparently decreased so rapidly, experimental error cannot explain it. This is a chart showing the decline in the speed of light from the published numbers in the last 150 years. You notice the decline in the chart. The speed of light is getting slower until about 1960. For the last 40 years, anybody that's measured the speed of light gets the same number. 186,282.4, I think, miles per second. Who cares? Well, <clears throat> it could be that it's, it leveled off in 1960 for two possible reasons. Three possible reasons. Our way of measuring is getting better. Instruments are getting better. We're smarter. You know, everybody in the past was dumb. We're smart. We got it right. Could be. That's what they'll tell you. Second option, though, is we're at the tail end of a logarithmic curve, and you're much less likely to see any decline. As you get further out on the logarithmic curve, it, it pretty much levels out. But a third reason is 1956 is when they invented the atomic clock. And they started using that as their clock to measure the speed of light. Well, now, wait, wait, wait. The atomic clock is based on the wavelength of a cesium-133 atom. So the clock is based on the speed of light. Now, if you have a clock based on the speed of light and you're measuring the speed of light with it, if the speed of light changes, you're never going to catch it with that clock. It's like watching two twi twins grow next to each other. Well, neither one's growing. <laughs> well, duh. You got a rubber ruler problem here. Clear back in 87, they said the speed of light was 10 billion times faster at time zero. There must have been a faster speed of light. There have been articles from the 80s, 90s, 2000s saying, look, the speed of light is not a constant. They said, no physical law prevents anything from exceeding the speed of light. In two published experiments, the speed of light was apparently exceeded by as much as a factor of 100. The Big Bang Theory requires a much faster speed of light. Uh, Dr. Magluelchi, or however you pronounce his name here, I got his book on the table. He says, the shocking possibility is the speed of light might change in time during the life of the universe. Could it be the speed of light was faster? Here's an article in uh, the newspaper said, speed of light may have changed over history, study says. Winnipeg Free Press, nothing's reliable, not even the speed of light. We have shown that a time-varying speed of light could provide a resolution to well-known cosmological puzzles. One of the mysteries of a decaying speed of light seems to be able to explain why opposite extremes of the cosmos that are too far apart to have been in contact with each other appear to obey the same rules of physics and even about the same temperatures. It would only be possible for light to cross from one side to the other if it traveled much faster than today, moments after the universe was created. Is the speed of light really a constant? The articles here in Reuters News Service, the speed, light, speed of light may not be a constant. I have dozens of articles like this in the last 15 years, and this will be much more detail in our college class about the speed of light. So don't let somebody tell you the speed of light is a constant. We don't know that. Big article came out in Discover Magazine. It says, was Einstein wrong about the speed of light back in 2000? He said, yeah, Einstein was wrong. The speed of light is not a constant. There's the book by the Italian scientist. I'm assuming he's Italian. He says, look, the speed of light is not a constant. And there have been many articles published about this. You can read them for yourself. I'll flash to them quickly here and you can get the details. So the third thing to consider. The creation was finished when God made it. Not only can we not measure those distances, not only is the speed of light not necessarily a constant, the creation was done. See, Jesus made wine out of grapes that never existed. He missed all that time. Instead of going from the water in the ground, through the plant, into the grape, squeeze it, make the wine, now drink it. No, Jesus turned the water straight to wine. What happened to all the intermediate steps? God can bypass all that. He doesn't need any of that. Okay? I asked people the question, how old was Adam on day six? Anybody know how old was Adam on day six? Zero. Did he look zero? No. He looked 52, 53 next month. But uh, he looked perfect top, you know, physical condition. God didn't make two babies and put them in the Garden of Eden and hand them a package of seeds and say, here, plant these quick. You're going to need supper. <laughs> it has to be a full-grown man, full-grown woman, full-grown garden. They got to have supper like tonight, you know. Better be something hanging on the tree ready to eat. Even if you plant a tree, you're going to take four or five years to get fruit off it. So the creation had to be mature. A fourth thing to consider about the speed of light question. A light year is a distance, it's not a time. 
It's a distance. And since the speed of light is not proven to be consistent, why would star distance have anything to do with the age of the universe? Now, I am not saying and have never said all of the stars are inside of a 6,000 mile radius of the Earth. That is not what I say. I don't know any creationist that teaches that. So when they say that, they're setting up a straw man, you know, knocking it down. They're, they're lying, basically. The stars probably are billions of light years away. They probably are. We just can't measure them, that's all. I like this article on the Discover. It said, how do scientists measure the age of stars? They said, well, we can find the absolute ages by comparing a star's color and brightness with those in stellar evolution models. What? We can tell how old it is by how old we think it is. That's exactly what they're saying right there. That's dumb, okay? Now, I think everybody's asking the totally wrong question. Everybody's saying, how did the light get from the star to the earth? They're asking the wrong question. 17 times in the Bible, it says God stretched out the heavens. Well, if He stretched out the heavens, they're asking the wrong question. It's not how did the light get from the star to here, but how did the star get from here to there? That's the question we need to be asking. The Bible says pretty clearly God made the earth first, and then He made the stars also. And He stretched, suppose He made the earth, and then He stretched out the stars from here. Adam would see the stars on day six, and day seven, and day eight. As the star is being stretched out into place, it's going to leave behind a trail of light. So the stars could be billions of light years away today and still have been created in the six days, 6,000 years ago. Russell Humphreys has a book, which I read, and I, I just have to say, I didn't understand it, all of it. He's really, really smart, but uh, it's a good one on starlight and time if you want to get more on that. I don't know that I agree with his premise. I think he starts with the assumption the speed of light is a constant. Now, how do we explain that? And they get into this warped space and bent space stuff. I don't go, I think it's much simpler. The speed of light's not a constant. And God made things and stretched them out into place. So, if that stretching took place, maybe that explains why we have a red shift. And we'll cover the red shift question in just a minute after the break.